Here's the basic idea you should have by now. Matter floating in a region of space gets pulled together by the force of gravity. And as gravity squeezes this matter together, there's an increase in both temperature and pressure. But there comes a point at which the temperature and pressure gets high enough that nuclei start fusing together. When they do, much energy is released. And this causes the matter to expand outward against the force of gravity. The result is a star. The most important thing for you to recognize here is that within any star, there are two fundamental forces fighting against each other. First, there's the inward pulling force of gravity. Second, there's the outward pushing force resulting from the thermonuclear fusion. Over the life of a star, these two forces go in and out of balance. When gravity starts winning, the star gets smaller. When thermonuclear fusion starts winning, the star gets larger. Much more common, however, is the case where the two forces find a balance. And when that happens, there's stability, and the size of the star remains fairly constant. The inward pull of gravity is pretty simple to understand. It's only a function of the amount of mass. The more mass, the greater the force of gravity. Stars certainly lose mass as, as they shine, which means the force of gravity weakens over time. But the amount of mass lost over the lifespan of a star is relatively small compared to the total mass of the star. To simplify things for our discussions here, let's assume that the inward pull due to gravity is not affected by this loss of mass. Over the life of a star, there's much more variability in the strength of the outward force due to thermonuclear fusion. When a star first forms, the source of the outward force is from the fusion of hydrogen into helium. This marks what is perhaps the most stable phase of the star's life. Stars within this phase fall within the main sequence of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And where they fall within the main sequence is primarily a function of the star's initial mass. Lower mass stars are found to the lower right. These are long-lived stars burning potentially for a hundred billion years. Why? Because they're just hot enough to ignite thermonuclear fusion, but not so hot that they burn through their fuel quickly. That's right. The hotter the star, the faster the rate of thermonuclear fusion. The more massive stars have a stronger inward pull of gravity, and this allows for more compression, hence higher temperatures and pressure, which means that thermonuclear fusion happens much more quickly. So these heavier stars are hotter, which is why they appear blue. They burn through their fuel quickly, which means they don't survive for as long as the lower mass stars. Their ages are measured in terms of millions of years, not billions. Now, I know that might seem counterintuitive. A star that has more mass is a star that has more fuel. You might expect the more massive star to last longer because it has more fuel. Well, it would, except for the fact that it burns through that greater supply at a much, much faster rate. So the brighter the star, the shorter its lifespan. As you can see from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, our sun lies somewhere in the middle along the main sequence. Its lifespan is expected to be about 10 billion years. It's already about 5 billion years old, so it's got another 5 billion to go before it... Before it what? Does it just fizzle out? Nope. This is where it gets interesting. So let's dig into the ultimate fate of our star, the Sun, and that of other stars in the next lesson. Good science to you.